to you guys again and to re reiterate some of what David said that you guys are really a a bang up group and the strike team is really a, a premier operation and I, I thank you for all the work you do both as active participants of strike teams and as folks that are just concerned with the hemlock as many of you know I've been working on this project for a long time um, 25 plus years and kind of uh, have been here since its infancy as, as a as a pest problem goes. Um, as Jackie mentioned, I'm with the US Forest Service Forest Health Protection in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, Hemlock Willie Adelge is one of my primary responsibilities. So, um, you know, I corral all the, the cats from state projects, uh, oversight to all the federal projects, both in the national forests and national parks and uh, work collaboratively with uh, the folks you see there on the screen to coordinate the activities for the Hemlock Willie Adelgid pro program east wide with my counterpart Dave Moselle up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and then with the research stations, um, Melody Keenan, she's with the Northeastern Research Station and Bud Mayfield here at the in Asheville with the Southern Research Station. So we're kind of the the brain trust, if you will, for the operations and uh, planning side of the Hemlock Willie Adelgid world. And uh, we're uh, happy to have groups like yours that that really do yeoman's work in uh, helping move this project along and keep it a priority with the uh, land resource managers the publics and all of our uh, stakeholders. So today I'm going to talk about an update. Uh, I think the last time I did a presentation um, with uh, this group, I kind of went over the Hemlock Willie Adelgid initiative. And uh, we have since the last time I was with you guys updated the initiative and kind of uh, made a more strategic approach to some priority issues that we're going to really focus on over the next few years. So we've been coordinating this effort through the Hemlock Willie Adelgid Initiative since 2003. And, you know, it's comprised of the Hemlock Willie Adelgid Working Group, which um, we don't actually meet, but, you know, it's basically all of you folks. You know, we have university scientists, federal scientists, um, federal resource managers, universities, tribal, uh, interactions and even private entities involved with uh, the initiative. Um, we have a steering and a coordinating committee. The steering committee is the basically the my director, some folks out of the Washington office, and uh, a few other folks. Um, one of which is David Arnold. He's our state forester rep. And we appreciate Dave's time and energy to kind of touch base with us and and make sure we. We are meeting the needs of the of, this, of our stakeholders, including the you know state of Tennessee, the landowners of Tennessee, and our federal uh, partners. Uh, as Jackie mentioned, we have for the past five or six, seven years had an annual program managers meeting, and that's where folks like Jackie and myself and all the other program managers for Hemlock Willie Adelgid work get together, um, usually in person. Um, hopefully, we're going to be able to meet in person this year up in New England and, uh, you know, share knowledge and uh, kind of help each other along with uh, making the, the best use of our resources to help combat Hemlock Willie Adelgid. We also have a biological control working group. Uh, that meeting was a few weeks ago. Uh, those folks are um, across the board, university, state, federal partners, uh, stem to stern, and the uh, Again, that group is uh, convenes to do tech transfer, knowledge, knowledge sharing, um, trying to keep on the cutting edge of the science by sharing everything we're doing with with the Hemlock Willie Adelgid Biological Control Community. Um, we have some other technical committees um, we're developing in the near future, um, civil culture resistance, things like that. Um, we have a smaller committee for leukotaraxis, which I'll talk about in a bit. But this plan um, we're initiating now um, 
is on the heels of our latest plan, which was last reviewed in 2014. And um, I guess we had planned to 2018 and then 2019 rolled around. And we started working on um, updating and then COVID hit and we've been trying to keep the ball rolling forward um, as best we can, especially with personnel changes in COVID. So the 2021 to 2025 program direction is, you know, of course, long term conservation of hemlocks, Eastern and Carolina. Um, and our mission right now is to accelerate development and impl implementation of effective integrated pest management strategies. Um, you know, to date, we've been doing a lot of chemical control and some biological control here and there, a little bit of silviculture work here and there. And now our task is to tie all these things together in a more integrated approach. And we're going to be tackling that over the next few years and answering a lot of questions. We provide financial support for much of the work within US Forest Service, mostly out of Forest Health Protection with a little bit out of the research stations. And of course, there are the matching dollars that the states come up with for their LSR programs like we have in Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina to fund groups um, like the strike team, the strike teams in Kentucky and the Hemlock Restoration Initiative in North Carolina. Um, Many of the things that are described in the new initiative direction and program are not actually funded or being funded, but they we considered them as priorities as management um, challenges continue. So we kept them on the sheet and we look for funding sources. And some of those are outside of my bailiwick. Um, you know, we're charged within forest health protection to deal with insect disease problems, weeds, storm damage, things like that. And, you know, delving into genetics work and silviculture work requires us to kind of operate outside our box and we, we do that readily, but um, funding can be an issue when we start talking about things that aren't in our purview. And of course we have the interagency coordination and you know your group um, is a great example of that. You know we have the state parks and TWRA and uh, Tennessee Division of Forestry and then the NGOs and all those people coming around the table like at this meeting to discuss options and move this uh, priority project forward. So uh, Dave Mosell kind of spearheaded this, but this it's a pretty good infogram, I think, that kind of lays out our vision in a visual sense. And, you know, we're basically concentrating on the biological control, breeding as we can as a group, insecticides and silviculture, and those things all tied together will hopefully help us be successful in an integrated fashion at keeping hemlocks alive, alive and functioning as they should in the ecosystem. And in my opinion, that means they're reproducing, producing seed, and we have uh, a future ahead of us with the seed production. Again, the goal of our biological control strategy is is long term. Our chemical controls we've always considered as a stopgap measure until we can, you know, develop a more long term sustainable control method or management strategy. And, you know, our objectives there are to release biological control agents, monitor them for impacts and establishment and then as available, redistribute them across the landscape. Um, many of you are familiar with the hemlock Willia delta life cycle here, but I'll just say, you know, we have the systems generation from early summer to early spring, then we move into the progredience generation. So with our systems generation that's out there right now feeding and uh, actively pulling the nutrients out of the hemlock tree. We have a couple of good biological control agents, and one of those is, you're familiar with is Laracobius nigrinus, and Laracobius osakensis, and Pat Parkman is going to speak later, I think, and talk a little bit about the rearing op op um, operation we have at the University of Tennessee and uh, give you some more details on that, but we've had a, a pretty good uh, success releasing these and establishing them in many places and Pat will again 
to update you on that. Um, our progredians generation, herein lies one of our problems. You know, we released a, a whole lot of Sasaji skin to Sugi, both in North Carolina um, and Tennessee and Georgia, and we don't have really good success at finding the, them. You know, when I say released a lot, we released millions of them. Uh, I think there's still some out there. You know, they were fairly robust in the lab and, and do prefer Hemlock Willie Adelgid. I, I'm just not sure that, you know, we can count on them to impact that progredience generation like we need them to. We also worked for a good long while on Schemosinulodulus. Didn't have a lot of luck rearing that in the lab. We did a few releases and it just didn't seem um, to sync up well with our uh, need here in the on the east coast of North America. Um, the most recent and I guess promising progredients predator is Leucotaraxis, which was formerly Leucopus. Um, they changed the name about a month and a half ago. And we have two species there, Panaperdia and Argenticolis, and they seem to uh, hold the most promise for impacting that progredience generation. So one of the issues we have is we can reduce the the uh, assistance generation significantly um, through the Laracobius nigrinus and Osakensis, but significantly isn't 100%. So we have a few adults left in the assistance generation. They lay eggs in the uh, progredience uh, hatch thereafter and then start to feed and impact a tree. So I think to be successful with biocontrol, we're going to have to have a, a spring summer predator. And right now we just don't have anything in place that can provide that uh, that control for the progredients. And that doesn't mean Laracobius isn't working, but it's just, you know, it's limited in its uh, feeding and life history to, you know, that autumn, winter, early spring feeding and then of course, we have the progredients bouncing back, so we call it the progredients bounce back. So it's uh, still impacting the tree, and I think we'll prohibit the long-term success of the tree, especially if one considers um, reproduction. Well, here we have a, a 20, 2003 to 2021 map of Laracobius nigrinus releases and recoveries. Now that map's hard to see, but you can see we have uh, pretty good populations in East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, Georgia, and through Virginia. And we're starting to see more work in the in the New England, uh, north northeastern states, because the Delta is starting to to build up populations and impact trees um, more significantly. Um, we had a study out of Virginia Tech that looked at Negrinus Negrinus dispersal. Uh, Jeremiah Foley, and uh, you can see there this, the squares are where the beetle releases were made, and the circles are where they were recovered. So you can see they're moving pretty well away from many of the uh, release sites, and uh, so that's promising. And one of the things we've discussed, uh, I've discussed with UT, and I haven't really talked to maybe a couple of people about it, Margo is doing some general space for Laracobius to grind us to, to find out how far and wide we, we do have it established and where our gaps and holes might be for uh, more releases or more priority releases where we don't have it established. Uh, Osakensis is a similar story. It's established very well. And Pat will touch on some of that I think later, but uh, you know we're, we're doing pretty good with Osakensis given the short short period of time we've been releasing it. Um, it hasn't been out and uh, operational as long as Negrinus. Leucotaraxis is the, the silver fly that I mentioned earlier, and we've done very limited releases with that um, and had no success to date in establishment, but those releases were done um, on a very small scale and in a probably a condition that's not great for for uh, the silver flies. Many of our releases in the south have been a bit late. Uh, we're learning more about its life cycle. 
um, basically these Leucoteraxa species are, are coming from the Pacific Northwest. Um, they're a cousin to species we have here, but the species we have here don't seem to prefer the algids. And, uh, you know, we kind of evaluated that back in the in the early 90s and didn't see any impacts. So uh, many years later, we started investigating, you know, more predator activity out west and determined that we could readily collect these Leucoteraxa species on uh, hemlock infested with adelgids out west. And uh, they have proven in bags that they can impact the uh, progredians generation pretty significantly. So I'll speak more about that in just a minute. So, uh, so we're focusing on Laracobia species for um, release right now. Um, we're, we're trying to, again, get a handle on where we have it established and where our gaps and holes might be so we can do more work with um, the grinus where it's most appropriate. And, uh, you know, of course, skip those areas that have well-established populations and, you know, seek out more priority areas. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is, you know, encourage uh, field collection in a, the appropriate settings and redistribution. Instead of just relying on lab-reared um, individuals, we could increase our product productivity by capturing these uh, Laracobius nigrinus and Osakensa species in the in the field and taking them to those areas where I described we have gaps or holes. So back to Leucoteraxis, um, it is one of our priorities in our most region strategic plan, initiative plan, and we're devoting quite a bit of resources um, to getting some answers pretty quickly on this. Um, we, we're able to get tens of thousands of flies a year out of the Pacific Northwest back here, um, run them through the lab process, screen out the the, um, the individuals that might be paras have parasitoids or not healthy, take the healthy flies, and we're going to do initially um, three kind of uh, strategies, if you will. Uh, we have some sites in Ohio and Pennsylvania where we're doing systematic inundative releases where we're releasing hundreds of flies uh, coming back a few weeks later releasing hundreds of more flies coming back a few weeks later releasing hundreds of more flies in one area so we can document establishment and find out if this thing can actually you know overwinter and reproduce and um, establish it on the east coast keeping in mind this thing is tiny and it's uh, a fly and it's eager to move around so it's a it's a challenge but we're going to tackle that as we can we're also going to do uh, a more a larger and more uh, a broad sleeve cage release um, that's where we take an individual limb and, and basically in sleeve it put a sleeve over it of, of mesh release flies at varying densities and um, then remove the sleeve and see if we get establishment similar to the initial studies, but those were done with five or 10 or 15 flies. And we're going to be using many more sites and many more flies to, to introduce the sleeve cage uh, project. And another project we're going to work on is, is one that was we, we worked on with uh, Saji Skinosugi and Laracobia stagrinus back in the early days with UT. Um, in East Tennessee, and that's whole tree cage releases. And that's where we go into trees that are, you know, 18, 20 feet tall. We developed a cage years ago that we could slide down over the tree, um, leave it on there for a couple of years, uh, release flies in there, and see if we can get establishment that way that we can actually measure. Uh, we're doing that in combination with uh, releasing, uh, releasing flies on trees that also have uh, Laracobia stagrinus and Osakensis on them, so we can kind of evaluate the dual impacts, uh, ideally, to document, you know, how effective this, this uh, combination of biocontrols might be. And uh, we're also thinking about trying to uh, 
develop more rigorous and uh, inclusive IPM demonstration areas. Um, we're also trying to revise and publish the guidelines for, you know, biocontrol to include leukotriaxis as soon as we have some solid data on, you know, what role it might play, similar to what we, similarly to what was done with Emerald Ash Borer. But again, we're going to be looking at release strategies, monitoring, monitoring protocols, you know, establishment success and impacts on on the adult population that's actually present. And then ideally, you know, look at movement and redistribution. Uh, Laracobia species, just as some examples we pulled together, um, you know, I won't read all this to you, but it, we've had really good success at going to areas where we've got well-established populations of uh, Laracobia species and uh, collecting them and moving them to other locations. Um, the numbers are, are pretty good. Uh, especially in North Carolina, and that was some some work we've been working on for a long time with uh, somebody that used to work on the project, and uh, we kind of spearheaded the efforts of getting establishment of Laracobius nigrinus here in western North Carolina. And uh, you know, it's been it's been a, a kind of a game changer as far as getting productivity because the labs can only rear so many. And of course, uh, Pat's going to share some information about Osakitsis later. But uh, we are looking forward to the time when we can collect more of those and move them around as well. But the demo projects, you know, what we're really going to start trying to look at is, you know, combining the Laracobia species, Leucotraxis together in combination with some silvicultural treatments that we know have some impact on the Delta populations with some um, varying insecticide treatments. Um, sublethal doses to some degree to just manage the adult population to let the biocontrols build up. And then, of course, in areas where there's significant impact, one of the things we need to tackle in the civil culture realm is restoration planting. And I know there's a lot of interest in that, um, especially in areas where we live in uh, the mountains here and where, you know, the adults come through and impact the populations to a, a significant level and we don't have you know, a lot of hemlock out there. So there's a lot of uh, energy and uh, interest in, you know, how do we get hemlocks back on some of these sites? And it won't be all of the sites by any stretch, but in those critical areas where we have, you know, streams or threatened endangered species that are super important, we would like to be able to get back in there. So we have to develop methods for doing that. We can't just go out there and throw a hemlock seedling in the, in the ground and, and walk away and hope it survives. There, there's definitely some things we can do to help uh, make sure that process is more um, successful. Again, to the technical committees, we have a civil culture technical committee. We had a first meeting um, last November, and we're just trying to get our head around all the work that's going on east wide within the, the world of silviculture. And there, you know, Bud Mayfield with the Southern Research Station. And, and myself and Robert Chaton have been working on a project to basically kind of release some trees that are surviving from the Adelgid. Um, we've got areas we need to reforest with hemlocks. We've got, you know, regeneration we need to figure out how to deal with to get get the, you know, the vast sea of seedlings that comes up, you know, into a more sustainable state. Lit reviews to do, um, develop a plan and uh, try to expand on our demo areas. Most of our demo areas are just small uh, one and two tree areas now, and we're looking forward to trying to uh, do some stand-wide silviculture work and, and develop some guidelines there so we can hand it to our, our cooperators and go, here's a, here's a management guide for you know, silviculture work that includes biocontrol and some chemical control, um, given all of our, our tools in our tool belt. Um, we're trying to delve into some technical committees with the resistance. Um, of course, most of this is long term work and funding is going to be an issue, but you know, there's there's some indication that some trees may be tolerant. We don't really understand why, but um, in my opinion, that may be largely due to 
the location they're growing on, the site they're growing on, and the amount of exposure they have. As I pointed out, I think in the past, you know, trees that are more open grown don't seem to uh, grow a delta it's quite as robustly, and a tree seems to be able to, I think in many senses, just outgrow the adelgid each year, and it takes many more years for that tree to uh, decline. So uh, some of the other things we're, we're always continuing to look at chemical strategies and refining those, and uh, we have a, a study um, with the University of Georgia to look at non-target impacts on some uh, salamander populations, and to date that work looks like there's not really much, if any, impact on salamander populations in our treated sites. Uh, we're always trying to look for the least toxic formulations. We're looking at actually evaluating a, a new pesticide for a delta control that seems to have a less uh, con, um, less environmental impacts than, than the perceived impacts of the uh, neonicotinoids. Uh, surveys and monitoring, um, we're working on you know, many kinds of uh, traps and guidelines for surveying and monitoring our bio biological control release sites. Um, remote sensing, I don't know, it's kind of been a here and there thing. Uh, there is some interesting work coming out of Cornell where they're using eDNA. They're basically collecting rainfall within uh, hemlock trees and they take that uh, collected uh, water and run it through some pretty high tech um, sieves, if you will, and parse out DNA from from adelgids, from our predators, from anything else that might happen to be in the stand is pretty interesting and it hopefully uh, will pan out because I think that's a tool that might be useful for for many other projects in many other ways. Um, Again, we're, we're always working on release and monitoring methods for all of our biocontrols. And uh, we have a an older website up at Virginia Tech. We're actually talking about revamping the website and figuring out where we might want to house that. And uh, I guess update it um, since everything's going digital and gone digital and uh, folks I guess one stop shopping would be nice for adelgid information. And uh, we're also trying to develop a, a database for our chemical control uh, locations, you know, so we can, as a, as a east wide community, you know, locate where chemical controls have been implemented and what kind of chemical control. And uh, part of that process is, is going to be similar to what we've done with our hemlock. Uh, Biocontrol database. Um, thankfully, uh, Jackie and Tennessee uh, agreed to be kind of uh, beta testers on, and developers with us in the National Park System with the Smokies. And we're going to pull some federal data in there and try to develop uh, that database that kind of will will serve us east wide. So there's you know a place you can go and pull it up and see where we've done treatments and when and how the treatments were done. Um, acknowledgements, our steering committee is the director for Region 9 Forest Health Protection. Of course, David Arnold is our state foresters rep. Kimberly Rice is with the National Plant Board. Tom Macy is with the uh, North American uh, State Forest Association. We have APHIS, um, representation. My director in Atlanta is Don Dewar and Barbara Bagley is our national entomological lead with forest health protection. And with the research stations, Ralph Crawford is the director for the Northeastern Research Station and James Boyd is, a, I mean, a deputy director and James Boyd is a deputy director with the Southern Research Station. So those are the folks that kind of, uh, I guess, watch what we're doing as a coordinating community, a coordinating committee and a community of folks working on this. And uh, they're also the ones that um, OK the funding for everything. So just want to acknowledge them. And at that, I can take questions. All right, so those of you who have questions, you have options. You can type them in the chat. You can raise your hand. That's one of the um, actions that you can choose to do. Um, or you could also unmute your mic. The issue with unmuting your mic is we might have more than a couple of people asking questions. 
So, but it does anybody have questions for Rusty? Rusty, I have to say, Lisa made a comment uh, in the chat, which I agree with. She said, great presentation, very impressive amount of work and science going on here. Kudos to the USFS and others contributing to this effort. Provides hope for a, for a vi vitally important species. So... Uh, Stephen Gritter has a question. What monitoring methods are used to recover silver flies? Well, to date, we we basically go out into areas where we've done releases and we at the appropriate time, we clip branches and bring them back to the lab. And uh, put them in a bug dorm, you know, it's a little tent that we use in the lab to catch um, to capture um, insects with and we watch them hatch out if they do. Um, we have caught a few native species, not very many. As I said earlier, we we tried to, I guess, uh, evaluate the, the existence or the presence of, of native species that might impact the adelgid. And in the early days, and didn't really have um, a lot of uh, success. So that's our primary method is to clip branches, bring them back to the lab and see what we get hatched out. Any other questions for Rusty? Dennis uh, Testerman asks, are indigenous representatives such as the Cherokee represented, represented in HWA work? So part of my charge is to work with all federal land managers. And so I definitely uh, work with the tribe, the Cherokee Nation, um, they're the only group here in our region that um, we have hemlock present and adelgids and we provide uh, funding to them to treat trees occasionally occasionally provide funding when they request it to treat trees on the, the common land and on their um, you know in, in, in Cherokee proper um, so you know yeah we definitely work with them um, and we've encouraged them, and I've, I've actually spoken to the tribal council a couple of times to think about implementing biocontrol and, uh, you know, getting started in that. Um, there's some interest there, but we haven't been able to, you know, get across that, that creek yet. But we're definitely there, and we try our best to do anything we can to help them out. Great, and you have uh, a lot of support from players that you know, Brant Miller, um, he agrees with Lisa, and then Margo, um, she says, great executive overview, Rusty, excited for what's to come um, and to be a part of this awesome endeavor. The next question you have, Rusty, is from James Merriman. Um, are you interested in treatment data input from private landowners? If so, can you provide a link for inputting the data? At this time, we're still tr trying to develop the database, so you know it's probably not not something we could use at this moment in time. But you know, and once we get it up and running, we have to basically introduce it to the to all the resource managers east wide, and that's going to be hundreds and hundreds, of course. So I'm yeah, you know, I'm not sure where when we might start trying to look at private um, landowner information, but you know, especially if it's significant, you know, I can see that that being something we might want to talk about. I know we have done some treatments here in Western North Carolina on private land that's in conservation easements or in, in some other kind of, uh, you know, trust. And of course, we would capture that data and that would be considered private land. But, you know, I think if you had significant hemlock and um, I'm certain that when the time comes, we could um, offload that data, that that information to our state cooperator, which would be, you know, the Tennessee strike team group, and then they could get that in there uh, when the time comes. But yeah, it's probably a good idea, especially if we have, you know, acres and acres of treatment um, per se. Does anybody have, yeah, does, um... James says, thanks. We have 1,200 acres next to Great Smoky Mountains National Park and have treated over 35,000 trees. That's awesome, James. Um, yeah, that, that would definitely fit in there to, to one of those places we, we'd like to capture, I think. 
Um, and that's something I'll bring up. We have a call in a couple of weeks to talk about the database. You know, we, we probably need to put a, a an ownership uh, column in there. Great, um, Margo. We've start says uh, we've started to collect private landowners treatment data in North Carolina on a voluntary basis. It's a great fundraising tool. Um, I'm also just so you know, Rusty, and uh, those of you in the audience, I'm also going to put links in the chat for more information out of Cornell University about the silver fly, um, as well as a link to a released report slash guide that was that came out last spring, which is the integrated pest management guide um, that uh, was released. So I'll put links in the chat for you all about that. Does anybody else have any questions for Rusty? So I, I will leave with this and so we don't get our hopes up. We're really concentrating our silver fly work on those three legs of the stool. And I know everybody's really interested in getting involved. And I guess I, I don't want you to be disappointed when we don't have the availability right now because we're trying to get answers and uh, we're still in an information gathering stage with with the, the leukotaraxis. So, um, I'm not saying that there aren't opportunities because we might expand that inundative release um, outside of Pennsylvania and Ohio and maybe into East Tennessee. We're actually discussing that. So, um, but you know, as far as getting a hold of the flies, you know, for for our, our normal release uh, situations, that's probably not going to happen for a couple of years. All right. OK, well, Rusty, it looks like um, we have exhausted the questions in the chat, so thank you well, so much as always for your support with what we're doing here in Tennessee and for that great review that you just gave us. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of big words in there that some people might be confused about, but I did record this, so if you want to um, review it sometime next week, I'll offer links for each of the presenters blocks. So thank you, Rusty. Yeah, and I'm going to have to duck out. Um, I'm actually going to a fire. Jackie, I was on a fire last night. I've got a fire today. So, um, yeah, the other duties as assigned here. So, uh, yep. <laughs> anyway, reach out if you have more questions. You can you can send them over to Jackie or or straight to me, whichever is best. And I appreciate the opportunity, and I really appreciate all the hard work you guys do, and I appreciate the the energy behind this. And uh, I, I think it's uh, it is. It is a premier uh, project and it's uh, it's actually expanded. I didn't mention that um, we're actually going to use the National Forest System. We've, we've worked out an agreement and maybe Jackie was going to mention this later, but we're going to. Um, the Forest Service is going to use the strike teams to treat the hemlock conservation areas on uh, the Cherokee National Forest. So, you know, it's it's getting even more support. So. Thanks again and uh, reach out if you need anything and I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Great, thanks Rusty. Okay, everyone, so at this point,